Okay, um, I'm happy to be here um, in your community of UNESCO chairs and uh, I'm supposed to say something about the global perspective uh, around OER and uh, I would like to start um, rather than talking about the past, uh, about what's happening now and so I'd like to share with you a brand new initiative under UNESCO patronage, it's called the Mind of the Universe and um, so we'll where is this? I'm looking for the point. Oh, yeah, it is. So please take two minutes to watch this small trailer. What if we create everything we can imagine? What if we can design and print any material? What if we connect our brains? Human knowledge is growing at an exponential rate. And when we all share this knowledge, we could create a whole new future. And create a common knowledge base, a worldwide infosphere. What if we can stop aging? What if we can program organisms and societies? Let's broaden our minds by taking a journey along the frontiers of science. Let's together build a mind of the universe. Making a television series, making all of its raw footage freely available for everyone to use and creating an open learning experience. What if our networks and search engines become autonomous? Let's tear down the barriers of learning for everyone, worldwide. What if all knowledge is accessible to everyone at all time? Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going to? These are some of the deep questions that scientists ask. Let's all share their thoughts. What if all this happens at once? What would that mean? The mind of the universe is a journey along the frontiers of knowledge. Giving new thoughts about science to everyone and by everyone. Let's all join and be prepared for tomorrow. So the sound was not very good, I think, but uh, I hope you got the message more or less. Um, I'd like to talk to you uh, about this initiative uh, for a few minutes because I became involved and this, in my view, is a pretty interesting thing. It started with a Dutch broadcasting company, uh, VPRO, and they were preparing for an open source television program, which is quite new. Uh, television has to be sold, as you all know. So he, here is an initiative where they try to, to set up an open source television series um, exploring the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, ten episodes will be made and Robert Dijkgraaf, he was the, the person in the, in the video, he is the former president of the Royal Academy of Sci Arts and Sciences in our country and he is currently at Princeton, he is the director of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Um, and we would like to include in each episode different scholars from different parts of the world, eminent scholars of course, and the episodes uh, have this, let's say, uh, um, personas involved, you could make an episode about the explorer, about the maker, the dreamer, the thinker, the conqueror, the seducer, etc, etc. To be broadcasted as of January 2017, that has been secured also financially. The idea was to, to scale it up, to widen it and to deepen uh, this idea of having a television program. Um, so we want to globalize the television program to variations in different countries, uh, different regions in the world, using different languages, replacing the host. So instead of Robert Dijkgraaf, take your own host, uh, put in other video clips and so on. We want to multiply the content. It's not enough to watch a television series. Uh, that is interesting to get appetized, but you, when you want to learn, you need additional content. So we want to create an expanding uh, content base uh, generated by a community of uh, people uh, in different parts of the world. 
and we want to um, provide uh, an what we call learning experience through that content, uh, which can be very diverse for different age groups, for in terms of different courses, um, not only delivering one MOOC by one famous professor from one university, but delivering quite a number of smaller MOOCs uh, being designed on the basis of the knowledge of uh, many more than one scholar around the world. Why are we doing this and how? Um, First of all, this is a real global initiative uh, in the world of open. So what we want to do is to give the message to a large audience around the world that the benefits of <coughs> acting in an open way are large for learners and for societies. That's number one. Number two is we can provide access uh, to lots of people wherever they live, uh, whoever they are, uh, what kind of interest they have in science and technology, and it can offer um, this idea for the Global North as well as for the Global South, which of course for UNESCO is very important in terms of perspectives, solutions and dilemmas. And finally, we're going to try a, a big experiment uh, with global collaboration with scientists, with uh, TV, video and graphic people, with educational specialists and um, people in the community who are infused by the idea and want to, to serve and want to contribute to the content and to the learning experience. Um, the way forward is that we are generating a growing network of people and of content uh, on the principles of sharing and openness. So openness of course is one thing, but sharing is a word that we are also using very often. So we share ideas, we share content and we share um, relationships between people. So we're engaging eminent scholars from the globe, uh, from different parts of the world, and we're partnering with uh, various global organizations. UNESCO, of course, the first one, has given patronage already to this initiative, but also the Commonwealth of Learning. Creative Commons has been said already before. Creative Commons is very interested in this initiative. Uh, the Open Education Consortium, and there's more to come. Um, also, the Open University of the UK, where I'm residing currently, is uh, probably taking up the lead in the learning experience part of this, this initiative. Uh, and we are talking to uh, two or three big multinational companies for becoming a partner in the digital content uh, component. Uh, and um, of course we talk to funders, um, and that's the most difficult part, I must admit. Um, but we're on the way, and um, the funding for a big share is already secured for the television series, but of course we want to make it bigger than only the television series in, um, in the Netherlands. We're also talking to a German uh, um, uh, broadcaster, ARD, for example, uh, and they have quite some interest to become involved, to the BBC, to American uh, broadcasters, and uh, there's more that might become involved as well. So this was just to give you a flavor, what, what can we do currently, and, and why are we doing this? And uh, this is fascinating, if you can really achieve this kind of ambition, and the ambition is high, and I'm sure the ambition should be a bit lower, uh, but by the end, uh, what, can, what we can see is a global movement uh, around sharing, let's say, what's happening with science and technology in the global north and the global south with many people and sharing what openness and sharing, uh, and sharing means uh, for many people. Now let's now look back a little bit uh, how this all started. Um, and I, I was quite happy that Jan already had his first presentation, so uh, quite a few things have been said already. So I would like to focus on uh, who were the global drivers and what were the most important milestones. Um, Jan already referred to 2001 when MIT started its open courseware uh, program and that was really brand new and very uh, a breakthrough. It was a large scale innovation where MIT decided all the materials to give away on the internet uh, for free. Then UNESCO came in in 2002. There was a, an important conference in Paris in 2002 and UNESCO is a, has been, still is, a very strong advocate of OER and is creating much more global awareness. Um, and I will get back to that later when we are talking about the Paris Declaration. Um, Hewitt Foundation, um, probably many of you have not known about Hewitt Foundation, that is a very strong supporter. They started in 2001 to fund uh, MIT and they have started many, they have since then, they have supported many projects, many activities in different parts of the world, not only giving money, but also giving strategic advice. Uh, so they are a very important player in the international uh, world. And then there's a, 
an interesting community, which is called the Open Courseware Consortium, started in 2005, initiated by MIT, and it's now called the Open Education Consortium. They changed the name. Uh, I think it has to do uh, clearly also with the discussion that Jan was uh, starting already. So we're talking about open education currently rather than open uh, courseware. Um, then the OECD, uh, um, Jan was referring to the upcoming book now, that's a report, but it's actually it's a book. It's called OER, A Catalyst for Innovation. And it will uh, be published in, 2000, uh, in November of this year. I've been involved as a, one of the advisors for this uh, book. And it's a very readable and very interesting and important um, publication, I think. But before, the OECD already in 2007 published a report and it was called Giving Knowledge for Free. That was a very influential report. And after I became involved in 2012 with a survey among the membership of OECD, uh, is there any policy available in, in the OECD membership? And it was. Um, but that was actually the time for OECD to decide, OK, um, we know that there is um, a growing interest in OER policies in different governments, but we need more evidence. And that was the reason why this new book uh, is being produced. In 2007, there was the Cape Town Declaration on Open Education. You see there is a shift from open educational resources already to open education in 2007. That was an interesting declaration, but it did not have, let's say, the impact of um, formal signing the declaration. It was signed by individuals, which of course is important, but what we need by the end is uh, signatures by, uh, by governments. Um, but it was a, an important declaration. Then the MOOCs came in in 2011, uh, or actually earlier in 2008 already, in Canada, where there was the first MOOC, but it came really in when the US started uh, with the most famous uh, universities to deliver MOOCs, and they call MOOCs the disruptor. Um, but I must admit, uh, Jan has already referred to that, MOOCs are not the real open thing. They have, it's an abbreviation for massive open online course, but uh, it's certainly online, it's certainly a course, but it's not <coughs> always open as you would like, and it's not always massive anymore. Anyway, the declaration from Paris 2012, um, I will get back to that later, and there's the European Commission. Uh, the European Commission was uh, coming in the, to the field in 2013. Um, they launched an initiative, and uh, Mitya will refer to that because opening up Slovenia is really based in, in what Europe is starting in 2013. Opening up education is the initiative called, and uh, like in Europe we want to uh, uh, create policies and also to fund. So we have a, a, a means of substantial funding of what we do, and that's why I think Europe is so important. Um, okay. National policies and strategies for OER. Um, in 2007, mind you, India was the first country to uh, embrace OER at the national level. That was interesting. Um, it was called the Report to the Nation, 2007, and they launched a national initiative. Um, and there were good intentions, but as quite often happens, it's nice to have a strategy or a policy, but it's even better to implement that strategy. It did not happen in India, although more recently they picked up the idea and uh, I see good things happening again in India. But India was the f really the first country in the world uh, setting the stage for embracing OER. Then the Netherlands was the second country. I was uh, happy to lead this uh, national program, which is called Wikiwise. Um, and the idea behind Wikiwise was to mainstream OER in all the educational sectors, from primary school up to university, and we came, we came quite, quite an interesting way. But when the funding was stopped in 2013, uh, the government uh, uh, was not as strong anymore in promoting this idea. Although recently, very recently, I must admit, uh, this summer, I uh, was very pleased to learn that the Dutch government uh, is getting into this business again. Uh, the US was another example, number three, um, very strong uh, as the most capitalist country in the world. They put a lot of money into OER, two billion dollars, and uh, it worked very well. And so that was the two billion dollars was meant to improve the community college system in the US, and it was pretty um, successful. Well, there's other countries um, promoting OER by giving money to projects or to uh, contribute to collaboration or to um, have specific measures. And 
There's also consideration of national approaches to OER years in alphabetical order, so not in the order of uh, importance in alphabetical order. Some of those countries, Brazil, Canada, with British Columbia and Alberta as the provinces, China, Indonesia, Japan, Kenya, Korea, Mongolia, Poland, Scotland, don't forget Slovenia, you will hear more about it uh, in a few minutes, South Africa, Turkey, the UK and Vietnam. And my question is, how about Germany? I've been in Germany a few times now, done some presentations, and uh, I see there's a big change, but we're looking for the real thing. This is what you do when you are using OER. You reuse and you remix and you redistribute what's happening. So this is Abel Kane's presentation from UNESCO. I was asking him, can you give me your, your, your slides? And he had about 25 slides. I, I made it shorter, of course, and I did some editing, uh, small editing, but I'm very happy that I can attribute uh, as in Creative Commons, uh, to Abel Kane's um, contribution. What is UNESCO doing? Um, there is the OER declaration. Um, there is a platform. Uh, I can... No, I skipped that. The OER platform is just a platform where UNESCO is um, uh, publishing their books and, and uh, reports uh, and publishing as an OER um, uh, publication. There's uh, guidelines, uh, you've seen uh, a few of those uh, publications uh, already being translated into German. Uh, there's a community that is active, uh, there's research chairs uh, from UNESCO, the first one was in the Netherlands, it's my chair, and the Canadian chair by Rory McGreal, then they had a chair in New Zealand, in Brazil, Mexico, Slovenia, and of course Mitja is uh, one of those six chairs that we have now. We run a joint program of action, so we don't have Unitwin network, but we have a network of uh, uh, collaboration which is very strong, so that we can circumvent that the one is doing a thing which is almost similar to the other chair. So, um, well, there's a big partnership that UNESCO has with the Commonwealth of Learning. There was this conference in 2012, and they have some uh, interesting projects to follow up on the Paris Declaration. Here you see those two of those publications, and you see. Um, Abel had on his slides coming soon, the German language, it, so it, it's an old slide, uh, the German uh, translation is already there. Um, the World Congress on OER in 2012, I, I was happy to be there, and it was a, a thrilling event, I must admit, although the, um, let's say, the, the impact of the event uh, is even stronger uh, than you could ever expect, because the declaration is not being adopted by governments. It's only being adopted by the Congress participants, which were scientists and government uh, representatives and, and different people. But the declaration, uh, in a way, uh, had a stronger impact than you could expect on the basis of just having Congress participants to, to sign it and to adopt it. Uh, so that's interesting to see. So UNESCO, I think, has, has played a very important role by delivering this UNESCO Declaration 2012. Um, Okay, this is about the conference, this is about the declaration. <coughs> yeah, well, this is the Paris OER declaration. Uh, it has um, a number of issues, and uh, you see, of course, one of the important issues is to foster awareness and the use of OER. Uh, number three is to reinforce development of strategies. Uh, number uh, five is to support capacity building for the sustainable development of quality learning materials. Then you have the strategic alliances for OER, uh, encourage research in OER, um, and the last one is a very important one, to encourage the open licensing of educational materials produced with public funds. If you're being funded by the government, uh, uh, it's a logical thing that you make the content that you have produced with funding from the government publicly available because it's public money. So that's, that's a very easy, understandable uh, issue on the Paris Declaration. And um, I think many governments are more serious than they do currently. This is a bit about the Europe project um, that is being undertaken by UNESCO. So they got money, $400,000 uh, for three uh, major activities. And Abel Kane was involved with two of them the awareness project and the policy project, and I was quite happy to collaborate with Abel on the policy project. Um, for the policy project, they were uh, targeting a few countries, Indonesia, Kenya, Oman, Bahrain, Vietnam, Senegal, Ghana, and Nigeria. 
And the results so far are um, encouraging, but also it shows that you have to be very patient. Uh, and we all know that, of course, if something is changing substantially, you have to be patient because it takes a while. Um, these are my last remarks, in addition to what uh, the slide of Abel has told us. Um, I've been working with Abel also on a project which is called Globalizing Open Abed. And uh, Open Abed is a, a, a European initiative from the European Open Universities. And uh, so they set um, uh, the stage in Europe by delivering MOOCs in a, a different ways compared to Coursera and edX and, and the other, let's say, uh, MOOC, the, uh, MOOC providers. Um, so this is a different approach. Um, we are using many, many languages, not only English, but also Italian and Spanish and, and Portuguese and Dutch even and, and Hebrew and Russian and Turkish. So it, it's a very diverse uh, MOOC um, initiative. And what we're trying to do is to inspire uh, our colleagues in Africa and in Asia the other open universities, where we have very big ones in, in Asia, you have a um, big operation in mega universities with more than uh, uh, a couple of million of students. So we, tr we try to inspire them to do a similar thing, not to copy what we do, but to do a similar thing in their own style and then to connect. Um, and there's a very interesting case which is in, happening now in Nigeria. The Nigerian National Open University uh, is organizing an event in December where they show that they have an OER policy in place because they showed the, the first 20 of 1800 courses to be completely OERized and also they're setting up MOOCs. And it's the first real good African example of a university that is doing uh, this good cause. The second thing that I've been, do been, been doing under the UNESCO umbrella is to uh, initiate a network of uh, PhD students, uh, the Global OER Graduate Network, which is connecting PhD students and well, I, I call them, I rather call them PhD researchers than students. So it's connecting them and supporting them and also the supervisors. Um, now we have about 35 of these PhD researchers um, and it's, it's very rewarding, I must admit. It's being funded by the European Commission and by the Youth Foundation. And now um, that my chair at the OUNL is, is not there anymore, uh, this initiative is being resided at, at the OUUK. Um, then there's the question of uh, preparing for a formal recommendation from UNESCO. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, it's nice to have a 2012 declaration, but it would be nice if UNESCO would be uh, able to um, publish and, and, and um, disseminate and also give much support to a recommendation. Uh, the idea would be to possibly take the fifth anniversary of the 2012 uh, declaration in 2017 but it's too early, uh, as many people say, so that might happen in 2019 maybe. Um, and there's a lot of debate in, within UNESCO headquarters uh, regions, I know. And, um, uh, but I think it would certainly help um, the whole global movement. And then last but not least, don't forget the Mind of the Universe. That's an interesting initiative uh, where I started off. And um, this is something that is just an example of a how you can set up a global initiative currently. It's very different from, let's say, 20 years ago. Uh, it's, it's because the internet is there, the community is there, and you can share um, in different parts of the world what is interesting. This was Abel Keynes, um, coordinates, and so if you want to be in touch with him, feel free to do so, and this is mine. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much.